Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Sulars here today to talk to you about Adolf Hitler and the rise in Nazi Germany, our next topic in the interwar period, and our study of world history. Our main question today that we are going to focus in on is the following. How did the Nazis under Adolf Hitler use terror, repression, and one-party rule to establish a totalitarian state in 1930s Germany? And so we'll begin the story today by looking at the Weimar Republic. We looked at this before in our studies, and if you recall, this is the government that was formed in Germany in the wake of World War I after the German Empire had collapsed with the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II, as well as Germany uh, taking the blame in the Treaty of Versailles and the heavy uh, penalties it would sustain as a result of losing the war. Now, this government, the Weimar Republic, was a constitutional democratic government. Uh, it was organized politically in a parliamentary system where seats in the German parliament were chosen uh, by the German people who voted for different political parties. And the majority political party would form a government. Very often, the leader of that party would become chancellor of the German government. In addition, the German constitution gave many democratic rights to German citizens. Most notably, women had the right to vote, very similar to that of Great Britain and the United States granting suffrage to women after World War I. In addition, the German government had a Bill of Rights where German citizens uh, were guaranteed certain freedoms, like freedom of speech, freedom of worship, etc. However, the Weimar Republic had a lot of problems it had to deal with, and a lot of it was a result of what happened in the fallout from World War I. First and foremost, there were many political parties in Germany, and as a result of that, uh, this division politically uh, lent the government to be rather weak. Many small political parties and very weak coalitions were formed throughout the course of the Weimar Republic, where the largest party, the Democratic Socialist Party, found itself under fire from the extremists. You have communists on the left who want uh, to start a communist revolution in Germany like what had happened in Russia. And you have conservatives on the right who want a stronger leader and a stronger, more decisive government and were constantly criticizing the Weimar Republic for being too weak. The Weimar Republic also was blamed for the Treaty of Versailles, particularly for the reparation payments. Now, if you recall, they didn't really have a choice in the matter, but they still received the blame from the Germany people for the reparations. And as a result of these reparations, uh, the burdens of uh, paying back the reparations to the Allies, to the British, to the French, was a burden on the German government and the economy. As a result, the German government decided to print money. Um, and in doing so, the idea was, well, we'll print our money to pay back reparations as well as to help the German people and the German uh, economy. But the government's printing of huge quantities of paper money led to inflation, which would soon churn into hyperinflation. For example, imagine this. You are a German citizen who in July 1922, for the case of this hypothetical example, would buy a loaf of bread for, say, 100 marks. A year and a month later, in August 1923, for that same loaf of bread now, instead of 100 marks, you are now paying 900 44,000 marks for that loaf of bread, uh, nearly 1 million marks. Uh, why did this happen? With too much money in circulation, the price of uh, the value of the currency became worthless. Shops and businesses had to raise prices, uh, and prices were uncontrollable. And as a result, people's salaries could not keep up with inflation, and so the money people were earning was worthless. In addition, people's savings uh, were worthless and they saw their savings go away. It was better use of your money to either put it on a wall or burn it to fuel your home than actually use it for day-to-day um, -day necessities. Now, this inflation would come under control by 1924 with the Dawes Plan, which the U.S. here spearheaded by influxing cash uh, and U.S. currency into the German economy to stabilize it. And as a result of that, eventually, by the later half of the 1920s, you do see the German economy stabilizing and getting a little better. However, if you recall, once 1929 comes around, heading to 1930, with the problems of the U.S. economy, the Great Depression itself would hit Germany and hit really hard. You'll see a return to inflation. You see high unemployment in Germany. Banks and businesses fail. 
and people losing faith in their economy also lose further faith in the German government, which they feel is failing them also. So this brings us to looking at Adolf Hitler and particularly his early life and a couple of seminal moments in his upbringing uh, where this young man here that you see in the chair and as a young boy uh, would become the leader of Germany by the 1930s. Adolf Hitler was born in Austria in 1889 and as a child had two uh, passions, you could say. The first, you could say, his passion about was war. He was obsessed as a child growing up, uh, reading about war, particularly Germany's victory in the Franco Prussian War in 1871. He himself uh, admired what the Germans did in unifying the country and uh, definitely was uh, all about German glory and German success in their past. In addition, Adolf Hitler was passionate about art. And as an uh, aspiring artist at the age of 18, Adolf Hitler moved to Vienna and applied to art school. However, Adolf Hitler was rejected. The most infamous college rejection letter ever. One of the big what ifs in history. What if Hitler actually became an artist? Would this all have happened? That's always a good question. Well, after being rejected from art school, Hitler tried to make it as an artist selling paintings on the streets of Vienna. Um, and he spent there a number of years and living in the Austrian Hungarian empire, Adolf Hitler grew up in a multinational multi-ethnic empire. However, the Austrian Germans felt they were superior. Uh, Adolf Hitler grew up with that notion that the German people were superior because they were the rulers and runners of the Austrian Hungarian empire. In addition, uh, Adolf Hitler developed, um, a fanatical anti-Semitism, uh, at this time, during his time living in Vienna, um, where he developed his prejudice against Jewish people, as well as other ethnicities that he deemed less than German. Uh, we're going to explore those ideas a little bit more when we discuss uh, the Holocaust. Now, another formative experience for Adolf Hitler was World War I. Uh, when World War I came, he was excited to go and serve. However, he did not serve in the Austrian army. Adolf Hitler served in the German army. And uh, he served throughout the course of the First World War. His unit that he served in saw very heavy fighting on the Western Front. He served as a runner. He was wounded at time, one time in battle. Uh, he also was temporarily blinded in a gas attack. And if you recall my discussion about gas attacks in World War I, uh, this is uh, one of the legends about Hitler is that uh, because he was injured in a gas attack, he shaved the handlebar mustache that you see him in here and did the little push broom mustache that he's more famous for. And so he could put his gas mask on. Well, uh, throughout the course of his service, he was uh, pretty distinguished. He was awarded the Iron Cross and by 1917 was promoted to Lance Corporal. However, uh, Adolf Hitler, like many German soldiers, were very disappointed by the outcome of the First World War. He was very upset that Germany had lost. He could not believe why Germany would lose. He thought Germany would naturally and should beat the French and beat the British and even the Americans and should have won the war and felt that something must have gone wrong as to why uh, the German people and why the German army lost the First World War. That anger uh, would find a place within the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party a political party that Adolf Hitler would join uh, in 1919. This right-wing extremist group, this nationalist group, uh, was very much at the fringe of German politics in 1919. However, Hitler found a home in the group. His uh, extreme nationalism, his uh, love for Germany, the German people, also believing that the German uh, loss in a war uh, was a conspiracy of... Uh, of politicians who were corrupt. Uh, he believed it was a conspiracy led by Jewish factions and Jewish people who uh, many Germans would blame for why the Germans had lost the World War, First World War. German Jews were seen as the scapegoats for many of the political and economic problems after the war. And Adolf Hitler definitely started promoting that idea. And as time goes by, Adolf Hitler within a year becomes the unquestioned leader within this Nationalist Socialist German Workers Party because of his gift of organizing people and his gift of speaking in public and be just being passionate about what he believed. In. And so by the early half of the 1920s, Adolf Hitler um, 
attracts uh, more followers to the movement. It is still a small movement. Um, and he's able to organize some of the supporters into fighting squads following a playbook by Mussolini and the black shirts. Uh, Hitler's um, fighting squads are known as stormtroopers who would often battle and intimidate their political enemies. And a lot of people who were attracted and joined uh, this small Nazi movement were former soldiers who, like Hitler, were upset about the political and economic situation of Germany. Well, by 1923, Adolf Hitler and Nazis thought it was time to act, uh, particularly in the context of the inflation going towards hyperinflation. And this is where uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis led the Beer Hall Pusht uh, in Munich, Germany. The plan was to seize power in Munich in a coup d'etat. And from there, the Pusht would start a revolution throughout Germany where followers would join to the cause where Munich would be the headquarters as a, and a power base for the Nazis, and then they would march on Berlin, very similar to what Mussolini did when his march on Rome, and as a result of that, take over Germany. However, many people did not get the message, and when the Beer Hall push started, by the end of the day, it had subsided, and the streets were in the control of the German army. Adolf Hitler and some of his uh, compatriots were arrested, tried, and found guilty of treason. Adolf Hitler would then spend the next year in jail and released early, uh, I believe, for good behavior. And, However, this time in jail was also another important formative moment in Adolf Hitler's life because it gave him time to think and put his ideas down and to clarify what exactly did he believe in, what exactly did he think, and what exactly does he think needs to happen in Germany in order to regain its greatness it once had before. All that will be written in his famous book, Mein Kampf, or Mind Struggle. Here, Adolf Hitler will lay out his basic ideology. This ideology would become the foundation for what the Nazi party would believe, especially when they take over Germany in the 1930s. First and foremost, it is based on extreme nationalism, racism, and anti-Semitism. Adolf Hitler was extremely nationalistic. He believed Germany was the superior people, the superior country, and racially and ethnically was superior to all others, especially Jewish people. Adolf Hitler believed that the German people are descendant from an Aryan master race, uh, an ancient people who were naturally uh, physically gifted, naturally intelligent, naturally talented. And the great enemy of the Aryan race uh, were the Jewish people, uh, who were always seen as, in Adolf Hitler's eyes, their greatest enemies. World War I was not lost because of the German army being defeated, but because of conspiracies of Marxists, meaning communists, and conspiracies of Jews, and conspiracies of corrupt politicians and other businessmen. It was not the fault of the German army. It was the fault of people behind the scenes who wanted Germany to fail. The fourth idea that Hitler lays out is that what Germany needs to do now is to unite once again into a great nation and to rebuild the empire, uh, rebuild a third Reich. In addition, to do this, Germany is going to have to gain land back, or Lebensraum. This is living space for the German people. Their living space had been taken away from them as a result of the First World War, and so it was the right of the German people to gain back the Lebensraum, their living space. And all inferior races need to, from this point going forward, bow to the Aryan people and hand over the land so they have enough room in which they can live. And last but not least, Adolf Hitler believes that Germany needs a strong leader, a Führer, to lead uh, Germany going forward to institute this new policy to make Germany a great nation once again and to rebuild the empire. Adolf Hitler had the perfect person in mind, and I'm sure you guessed by now, he thought it was himself. So after Hitler and was released from prison, he starts a campaign, a very slow and steady campaign, in the later half of the 1920s where the Nazi party is going to use democracy to their advantage and more or less win the argument and win the hearts and minds of the German people in their rise to power. And one of the things you have to realize is that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, just like Mussolini and the fascists, 
came to power in the respective governments legally according to the rules and according to the constitution of that nation. So what happens? Well, the first thing Hitler realized is that the Nazi party was more of a, a regional party in the southern part of Germany. And so, Ger so the Nazis had to nationalize. They had to expand their membership. And so they go from a few thousand followers in the mid part of the 1920s until 1932, having 800,000 members throughout all of Germany and by far be, uh, representing the largest party in the German parliament or the German Reichstag. Now, when the Great Depression came, this plays right into Hitler's hands. And, uh, and because the Great Depression hit Germany hard, Hitler's ideas and promises, which at first by some people thought were pretty extreme, started seeming real appealing. Because Hitler's discussion and his promises that he starts making on the trail uh, to win seats in the German parliament for the Nazis were to end the reparations, the crippling reparations from the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, Hitler promises to create jobs, and those jobs will be created in manufacturing, where the German people will re rebuild equipment and gear to rearm Germany, a violation of the, the, for city, the Treaty of Versailles. And in doing so, Hitler also is recalling the past glories of Germany, the First Reich, the Holy Roman Empire, the Second Reich under Kaiser Wilhelm I and Wilhelm II. And so... Hitler and the Nazis start gaining a broad range of support across German society. Uh, veterans from the First World War were attracted to the message. Workers in the German uh, workers in German factories who had been laid off uh, were attracted to this message. A lot of lower middle class Germans uh, saw this message as uh, promising to them. Germans living in s rural areas or in small towns also were uh, joined on board. Even elites in German society, elites in the industry, uh, aristocrats, military elites, higher bureaucrats, all found something within a Nazi message that was appealing to them, uh, and it saw that was in their best interest and to their own benefit. But ultimately, uh, one of the things that really helped Hitler and the Nazis was fear of communism, uh, because communism seemed to be like an experiment that was working in the Soviet Union. Uh, because the Great Depression had not hit the Soviet Union as hard as many other countries. And so Hitler used that to his advantage too, stroking up fear that communists were trying to take over Germany too, just like Jewish people were. And so by 1932, uh, if you can look on the graph on the left, the Nazi party uh, had gained uh, pretty significant seats in the German Reichstag, actually gaining a majority of seats. And through some finagling, and negotiation, uh, Adolf Hitler by 1933 was chosen chancellor or head of the German government. Uh, von Hindenburg was the president, and the idea uh, came for Hitler becoming chancellor by the conservatives, who wanted to form a coalition government with the Nazis. They believe they can control Hitler, and they believe they can control the Nazis and push forward a more conservative agenda and bring some stability to Germany. However, circumstances on the ground quickly changed within a few months after a fire broke out in a Reichstag, and Adolf Hitler, uh, in this time of crisis, was able to convince the Reichstag uh, to pass a law referred to as the Enabling Act. The Enabling Act would give the government, or primarily the Nazis, uh, who had the majority of the seats in Parliament, the power to ignore the German constitution more or less for four years while it issues laws to deal with Germany's problems. And this legal foundation gave Hitler and the Nazis uh, the legal basis for establishing a totalitarian state in Germany. So over the course of the next four years, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis would institute a series of political, social, economic, and cultural policies in order to tighten their control over Germany and to create a new Nazi state. And that's a conversation which we shall share for next time. Thank you for listening and have a good day.